الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم إن شاء الله we begin as usual with the quiz Everybody ready for the quiz? Mr. Barner All right um, If any is not in the WhatsApp group you need to join the group as well in order to join the quiz right? So um, if you haven't joined the WhatsApp group, you can scan the barcode, the QR code, and this will take you to the WhatsApp group. All right, so I posted the link in the, uh, in the group. All right, so if you like, if you'd like to participate in the quiz, click on the link. Uh, we'll give everybody a few minutes to sign in, inshallah. All right, we ready? You need help? Okay, um, let's begin. You can, anybody else afterwards, you can still join in. All right, let's start. So, same format as last week, right? Multiple choice questions. We'll try to answer as, as quick as possible. 20 seconds, within the 20 second limit. All right, let's go, Bismillah. First question. Well, the Prophet ﷺ says the first injustices to be settled among people on the Day of Judgment will be those involving what? <clears throat> First injustice is to be settled on the Day of Judgment, those involving bloodshed. Bloodshed. Right? The first disputes settled are between uh, those who have wronged each other with blood, killing, killing, murdering. All right, bloodshed. It's the first thing that we've settled on the Day of Judgment with regards to injustice between people. All right, next question. What is the meaning of arribaat? Arribaat. Arribaat. It's also called murabata. Okay, both are our names. And this is right, guarding the frontiers, guarding the borders of the Muslims. Guarding the borders, guarding the frontiers. So it's called ar -ribaut. And it's the type of jihad. All right, next question. The Prophet ﷺ said that this leads to goodness, and goodness leads to Jannah. It's a hadith we should all know. Very important hadith. 
As-sidqu yahdi ila al-birr wa al-birr yahdi ila al-jann. Truthfulness leads to righteousness and righteousness leads to jannah. And on the other hand, lying leads to fujur, wickedness. And wickedness leads to the hellfire. Next question. Is it allowed to turn one's back and leave the battle? Hmm? Is it allowed to turn one's back and leave the battle? In certain situations, what are those situations? Okay, you're regrouping. And? A tactical retreat, right? Tactical retreat or joining another force, another battalion. Other than that, other than those two situations, it is a major sin, major sin to leave the battle. If the numbers, yeah, the, uh, if the numbers, you don't start the battle to begin with, right? But once the battle starts, then you have to, you have to face, you have to face them. All right, next question. From the spoils of war, how much of it must be given for Allah and for the messenger and his relatives and the orphans and the needy and the stranded traveler? So the verse in Surah Al-Anfal. All right, this is called the khumus. All right, the khumus. وَعَلَمُوا أَنَّمَا غَنِمْتُمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَإِنَّ لِلَّهِ خُمُسَهُ That Allah for Allah is a khumus, a fifth of it. وَلِي رَسُولِهِ وَلِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَ وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَبِنَ السَّبِيلِ All right, this is one-fifth of the spoils of war must be given to this category, these categories of people. And the, the other four-fifths are then divided amongst the, the, the fighters, those who took part in the battle. All right, next question. It is allowed to betray someone if they betrayed you first. True or false? All right, the answer is no. The hadith says, Adil amana ida ida ila man tamanaka wa la takhun man khanak. Give the trust to those who entrust in, in you, but do not betray those who betray you. Do not betray those who betray you. Even if somebody betrays you, you cannot betray them back. Wa la takhun man khanak. Do not betray those who betray you. Next question. Which of the following sins requires an atonement, a kafara, which must be paid when this sin is committed? You want to answer? All right. Um, all of them, right? All of the previous. Murder, breaking oath, dihar, type of divorce, all these require a atonement. Specific, there's a specific penalty a person has to pay if they commit any of these sins. Next question. The original ruling regarding remaining firm in the battlefield is that if there are 20 steadfast believers, they will overcome this amount. And then this command was later abrogated. Alright, so this is the verse in Surah Al-Infal as well. There are 20, then they must stand in the face of 200. And then Allah later abrogated this to make it 1 to 2. Next question. Yeah, you earn it, yeah. Looking forward to meeting the enemy in a battle is a sign of Iman. True or false? Uh, 
And the answer is false. Rasulullah says, لا تتمنوا لقاء العدو. Do not hope to meet the enemy in battle. وسأل الله العافية. I would ask Allah for safety, security, and well-being. But then when the battle starts, then you need to be remain firm. Uh, all right, last question. Last question. The Prophet says, on the day of resurrection, every blank will bear a banner. Person will have to bear a banner, carry a banner, carry like a flag. Treacherous. Every treacherous person will have to bear a banner. And it'll be said that this person is, look at the treachery of this person. All right, out of uh, as punishment for them. Every treacherous person will have to bear a banner on the day of judgment. All right, who came on and talked today? Third, IR. We have a lot of initials today. MashaAllah, Brother Roshan, again, took the prize. Anybody want to claim these initials? <laughs> ZR, IR. Okay, maybe a female downstairs. All right, inshallah, we begin. Uh, starting from 39. The 39th branch of Iman. This one is a bit very long. It brings a lot of uh, verses and, and uh, quotes here. التاسع والثلاثون من شعب الإيمان وجوب التوضع في المطاعم والمشارب والاجتناب عما لا يحل منها. Right, this branch is talking about avoiding the haram, avoiding the haram, food and drink and whatever else is forbidden. And he brings a number of verses. The first uh, set of verses he brings deals with the prohibition of alcohol. All right, uh, the prohibition of alcohol. Before that, before alcohol, he brings the, uh, the prohibition of certain types of meat. So carrion, which is meat that has not been slaughtered uh, in the Islamic way. And the meat of pigs. And now it says meat here, right? Or right, the meat of pigs. But the scholars have mentioned anything. Any part of the pig, not just the meat. Any part of the pig is unlawful for consumption. All right, so you don't read this verse and it says meat and then you think you get take a benefit from other parts of the, the pig. Any, any part of the pig is impure and it is forbidden to, to benefit from. <clears throat> All right, the pigs, uh, anything that has not, Allah's name has not been pronounced over, the animal has been strangled, and the verse continues with an, a few other uh, types of meat that is not allowed. Uh, and then the verse uh, about, uh, say, I do not find within that which should be revealed to me anything forbidden. Uh, to one who would eat it, unless it be a dead animal or blood spilled out. This verse mentions dam al masfuh, flowing blood. All right, this is what's prohibited. So when you slaughter an animal, right, um, there's blood that comes out, flows out, and after that blood comes out, there's still blood, right, in the meat. There's still blood in the meat. That meat or that blood that remains, this is that's overlooked. All right, that is overlooked. What is haram is the blood that the flowing blood when you slaughter the animal. And the flood, the blood that flows out, that not, that needs to come out. Anything that remains after the the, the, the meat has been uh, slaughtered and the blood has the flowing blood has come out, come out, then that is overlooked. Right? That is overlooked. So that is allowed to consume. What is uh, forbidden is the, uh, the 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 flowing blood, the blood that spilled out when slaughtered, or the flesh of swine, as we mentioned before. And all these are uh, Allah calls them fisk. They are dis this is, they are all disobedience. All right, then uh, the verse on in, uh, intoxicants. إِنَّمَا الْخَمْرُ وَالْمَيْسِرُ وَالْأَنصَابُ وَالْأَزْلَامُ رِجِسُ مِنْ عَمِلِ الشَّيْطَانِ That intoxicants and games of chance and adulterous practice and the dividing of the future, all of these are those some works of the shaitan. This is the main verse that prohibits alcohol. All right, this is the main verse in the Quran that prohi prohibits bring the prohibition of alcohol. There are some people who say that the Quran does not prohibit alcohol. They say that nowhere in the Quran does it prohibit alcohol. And this is a verse that we use to prohibit alcohol. All right, uh, but they say that these things are, or the alcohol has not been explicitly pro uh, prohibited. And the answer to that is, if you look at the verse, Allah says at the end, uh, uh, Avoid it. All right, 
Pakistan people will avoid it. So this is uh, a proof that alcohol is forbidden. Because if you have to avoid it, that means you can't consume it. Just like Allah says about zina. Wala taqrabu zina. Do not approach, do not come near adultery. Meaning, if you can't come near something, then by higher right, you cannot perform that actual action. So Allah says, stay away from alcohol. If Allah says, stay away from it, don't even go near it, then that would also include not consuming it. So those who say that there's no specific or explicit verse, then we say that this verse is very explicit. Because Allah, if Allah says, do not go near it, then this would also mean do not drink it by, by even uh, higher means. And then other verse, they ask you about intoxicants and games of chance. Say in both are major sin. All right, so these are all verses uh, talking about alcohol, prohibition of alcohol. Um, yeah. The games, we're going to get to that later. Right? That's going to come a bit later on. So we'll save that for that. <coughs> um, it's been said, there's another verse where Allah talks, uh, mentions the word ithm in this, in this verse here. Say, my Lord has forbidden. Uh, only shameful acts, be they open or secret and sin, and sin, this word sin, al ithim, and wrongful oppression. Uh, this word ithim, it's been said that it's a name for alcohol. Right? They say, it's, uh, so some scholars mentioned that this is an, one of the names of alcohol. So, and then he brings uh, some couplets of poetry to show that the Arabs, they would use this word to mean alcohol. Right? He, dr he brings some uh, po uh, couplets of poetry, I drank ithim, meaning alcohol. Until my mind went uh, awry. Truly, ithim, meaning alcohol, does away with the minds of men. So, if the word ithim in this verse means alcohol, then this is another clear proof that alcohol has been prohibited. All right, if we say it means alcohol, uh, then it's been clearly prohibited uh, according to, uh, if we go with that meaning, that the, 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 the word ithim means alcohol. All right, then we have general ahadith about uh, what constitutes alcohol. Is it just all right, fermented wine or fermented grapes that turn into wine or is it anything else more than that general so we have the hadith every drink that intox intoxicates is forbidden every drink that intoxicates is forbidden and the other hadith every intoxicant is a form of khamar and all wine is forbidden all right so this hadith is very general anything uh, that that uh, intoxicates that clouds the mind then this is comes under the ruling of alcohol and it is forbidden Right, so there, there, were, there, there are some people who, 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 who are of the view or early, very early on that alcohol, the only thing is prohi prohibited are, is the alcohol from wine, from grapes. But these hadiths mention very clearly that uh, it's not just what comes from grapes, the fermented from grapes, but this is anything that clouds the mind. Anything that clouds the mind. And the word for alcohol is uh, khamar, right? Khamar. And this, this three word, uh, three letter root, kha, meem, ra, it means to cover, cover the mind, right? Cover the mind. And this is why when a woman covers her head, what do we call that? Khimar, the same three letters, right? When you cover your head, the khimar that she wears, this is from the same root. Alcohol does it covers a person's intellect. So this, this is the connection there in, term, in, 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 the, uh, in the root of the word. The same root letters, the same root letters. So it's called a khimar because it covers your head. And they call it alcohol because it covers your mind, basically. It covers your mind and it prevents a person from thinking properly. Now, alcohol will be there in the hereafter. As it comes in hadith, uh, anyone who drinks wine in this world and does not then repent, it will be forbidden in the afterlife. Which means that there is alcohol in the next life. And this is mentioned in the Quran, that there are rivers. That there, is, there are rivers. There's four types of rivers, from uh, milk, wine, uh, pure water, and honey. All right, four rivers mentioned in, in the verse. One of them is a river of uh, alcohol. So alcohol will be there in the hereafter. But the alcohol in the hereafter is pure. And it does not have any of the ill effects that it has in this life. So alcohol has some kind of benefit in this life. Allah says in the Quran, right? Uh, Allah says about alcohol, it has manafi, it has benefits, such as the social benefits. When people drink alcohol, they feel a little bit better, and uh, you know they're a bit more social, and whatever whatever other benefits come with it. But ithmuhuma akbaru min But Allah says the, the 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 harms outweigh the benefits. So there is some kind of benefit in the alcohol, and for this reason, 
Allah will allow alcohol in the, in the hereafter, but it, but He will make it in a form that is gets rid of all the all the harms. So it might have some kind of benefits, but the harms outweigh the benefits. The harms such as a person when they drink, uh, they end up having to vomit, uh, they end up losing their honor. They do things that you know uh, make them uh, perform actions that are below their dignity. All right. So there are anything that uh, is from the harms of alcohol. This will be removed in the alcohol in the next life. So it will only be pure alcohol that has the benefits, removing all the harms. But if you drink alcohol in this life and you do not repent, according to the hadith, then you're going to be deprived of this in the hereafter. And intoxicants. Yeah, in general. Intoxicants. Yeah. You had a question? And we know then uh, on, the, on the, the night journey, when Rasulullah was taken up to the heavens, he, before he was taken up, he was presented with two choices. Right? During the, uh, the Isra night journey, Rasulullah was presented with two cups, one of wine and the other of milk. So he looked at them and he chose the milk. Uh, some of the scholars have mentioned that the wine he was presented here was not the wine of this world. It was the wine of the Akhirah. So he was presented with a pure wine. So if he would have chosen that, it wouldn't have been haram because the, the, the wine he was presented was the wine from Jannah. But nonetheless, he still chose the milk. He chose the milk even though the wine he was presented was pure wine. Uh, and when he chose the milk, then Jibreel said, Praise be to Allah who has guided you to the fifth rock. Had you chose the wine, your community, your ummah had, would have gone astray. And uh, we mentioned this other hadith before. When a, when a man drinks wine, he's not a believer. And we said that this, uh, this hadith is to be interpreted meaning that they ha this person has lost complete iman. They don't have complete iman. The iman is extremely deficient. But we said that if a person commits any major sin, drinking wine or anything else, they're still a believer. They're still a Muslim. And we do not uh, take people out of the religion unless they commit kufr or shirk. Or they, they say that these things are permissible. Right? They, they, they make these things. They, somebody says that alcohol is permissible then this is different now. Or somebody says, adultery is permissible. Now they have exited. But just by merely committing these sins, they are deficient in their iman, but they're still a believer. And uh, we have a number of statements as well, talking about the, uh, the harms of alcohol. Um, al Hasan al-Basri says, how could any man ruin his mind when, which is the most beloved thing in Allah's creation, with wine? So the thing that distinguishes us from the animals and from any, any other creation, is that Allah has given us intellect. So when you drink alcohol, you are, uh, you are attacking the very thing that Allah has placed, made you above all the other creation, the animals and the insects and all these things. Allah has given us intellect. So when you drink alcohol, you are compromising that intellect, which has made a person beloved to Allah, or makes human beings the, the, the saddest they have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, we're not gonna mention all of these uh, quotes. Uh, moving on to the next, uh, hadith. So this, we just finished the, the 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 part about the alcohol. Moving on to some more general, about more general uh, regarding eating and drinking halal. So he mentions the hadith in Sahih Muslim, uh, where this man, uh, or before that, Inna Allah tayyibun la yaqulu illa tayyiba. Allah is pure or is good, and He only accepts that which is good. And then at the end of this hadith, uh, Rasulullah mentions a man, and he, he brings the, the the verse as well. O mankind, eat of the good things which have we have provided for you, and we thank thankful to Allah. And then uh, the Rasulullah mentions a man uh, on a long journey. He's disheveled. His hair is disheveled. He's dusty. He raises his hands up to the heaven, and he says, My Lord, my Lord. But yet his food is haram, and his clothes is haram, and his drink is haram, and his sustenance is haram. How then shall his dua be answered? All right, so uh, this man has fulfilled all of the conditions for an accepted dua, right? He is traveling, right? We know the travel person, traveler's dua is accepted. Uh, he is in a state of extreme uh, humbleness and submissiveness. He's, you know, he's uh, disheveled, or right? he's dusty. He is in a state, he's in a very low state. And this is what Allah wants when you make dua to him, that you lower yourself for him. And he's raising his hands. The etiquette of dua is raising hands. So he's fulfilled all the conditions for an accepted dua. But yet, because his food is haram, 
and his clothes is haram and his drink is haram, then and his sustenance is haram, then his dua is not answered. His dua is not answered. Uh, then we have the hadith of uh, Nu'man ibn Bashir that the Prophet says, "Inna al-halal bayyin wa inna al-haram bayyin wa baynahuma umur mushtabihat." That halal is clear and haram is clear. We know that the, the flesh of swine, pigs is haram. All right, we know that you can drink water. So the halal is clear, the haram is clear. And then between that, there are things that are unclear. Most people don't know that. Most people are not aware of the rulings. So in this situation, a person should be careful with these unclear matters. Avoid these unclear matters. And whoever does this, uh, whoever avoids the uh, unclear matters, then they have preserved their honor and they preserved their deen. They have preserved, this person has preserved their honor and their deen. And then Rasulullah Sallallahu mentions the uh, example of the one who delves into these doubtful matters. Right? So you have food that is doubtful or drink that is doubtful. You don't know the ruling of it. What should you do in a situation like this? Avoid it. Avoid it. And then the example is like the person who, the shepherd who is grazing his flock around a sanctuary. So there is, they, they used to have, uh, back in the days, the, the, the king would have like a sanctuary, right? A, uh, a land specific to the king. Or this land is specific to the king. No one can go on this land. And uh, there would be, shepherds would come and they would graze their flock. And they would come very close to this private land of the king. So Rasulullah says that the one who is delving into these doubtful matters, he's like this shepherd who's going very close to the king's private land. And what's going to happen is that if he keeps going close and close, eventually he's going to, the, 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 the animals are going to end up eating from the king's private land. So similar is a shepherd who grazes his flock around the sanctuary so that he is near to violating it. Every king, indeed every king has a sanctuary and Allah's sanctuary on this earth is composed of his prohibitions. So if you, you don't commit the prohibitions but you go into those doubtful matters, eventually a person who's always falling into the doubtful matters, they are going to fall into the haram. They're going to fall into the haram just like the person who is always taking his flock close to the prohibited land, eventually his flock is going to end up on the prohibited land. So he's just, if you want to keep away from the prohibited land, stay far away so you don't fall into the prohibited land. Keep away from the haram, keep away from the doubtful matter so you don't fall into the uh, haram. Are you talking about somebody declaring something haram? The hadith is general, right? The, say that again. No, this is not talking about somebody making something halal or haram. This is talking about the, the fact that we, everybody knows where certain things are halal, right? Everybody knows. There are certain things that everybody knows is halal, right? And there are certain things everybody knows is haram. And then there are certain things in the middle, you might not know the ruling of it, right? You might not know, is it halal or is it haram? All right, these are the doubtful matters. I'm not sure if I understand the question. Uh, that's slightly different. That's that, that's different. That now, you, uh, if a person does that, then they are speaking without knowledge. That that falls under speaking without knowledge. If you are something is halal and you say it's haram, or it's haram and you say it's halal, then now that falls under speaking without knowledge. That's that's different. Right? That's different. Mm. Yes, yeah. 
Yeah, this is the quality of the, the, the people, the, the scriptures, the Jews and the Christians, that their rabbis would uh, make, make halal what is haram, and make haram what is halal. So this, this is slightly different. This is talking just in general, that there are certain things that are halal, clear, certain things that are haram, clear, and then in between there are certain things that a person might be unaware of or they might not be sure. So those are the doubtful matters. For the doubtful matters, try to avoid them. And a person who's always falling into doubtful matters, then eventually they're going to fall into uh, haram. A uh, few, a few uh, incidents or examples of people who are very careful when it comes to consuming haram. He brings the example of uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So Abu Bakr had a servant, and this servant brought him some food. Right? And then uh, the boy, uh, so Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu ate this food, and then uh, the boy asked, uh, the boy asked Abu Bakr, do you know what that was, what, what, what you just ate? And Abu Bakr said, he asked, what is it? And uh, the boy responded, in the days of Jahiliyyah, I was a soothsayer. And uh, something which, in fact, I, I did not know how to do. But I see, he was pretending to be a soothsayer. It wasn't really a soothsayer. And he deceived the man who met me. He said, I deceived the man who met me just now, and I gave, and gave me what you ate. So, in other words, Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, ate something that was uh, a result of this man tricking somebody else. Right? This man deceived somebody else, and he got this uh, whatever food he gave him. And then he told Abu Bakr, this is the food that I just gave you. So Abu Bakr put his finger in his throat and he made himself vomit. He made himself vomit, all that was in his stomach because of uh, what this servant told him, that the, how he uh, arrived at this food, or how, he, how he obtained this food. Uh, then something similar for Umar radiallahu anhu. Umar, he, he once drank some milk and uh, he liked the milk and he asked, where did you get this milk from? And then the man who gave him the milk, he said that on his way to a well, he passed by some animals which were given in charity. Right, so these animals were given in charity and uh, he saw some people milking them. And he had taken some of it in his water skin. So this, this, this milk was uh, for, from, from, from animals that were for charity. So these animals are not supposed to be, they're not supposed to be touched, they're not supposed to be benefited from, they're for charity. So now this milk is doubtful and Umar radiallahu anhu, he did the same thing. He put his finger in his mouth and he vomited it all up. Right, so this just shows the, the, the level of which the Sahaba would go to make sure that they're not consuming anything that is uh, impermissible, anything that is haram. A uh, quote here, uh, Yusuf ibn uh, Ashbat says, when a young man worships, the shaitan says, look at his food. If they find his food to be from an impure source, he says, leave him alone. Let him worship long and hard, for he himself has ensured that your efforts are not needed. So the shaitan, when he sees that a person is consuming haram, then they talk amongst themselves and they say, leave this, leave this person alone. You don't have to worry about him because he's already, you know, destroying himself. So you don't need to do anything. All right? So they say, leave him alone because he's already destroying himself with whatever he's consuming. Uh, and then some other quotes mentioned about, uh, to summarize, it's better for a person, I'm not going to read the entire quote, but it's better for a person to pray in the last row and make sure that you are consuming halal Rather than you come in the first row, you rush to go, go in the first row and your food and other drink and, and, and anything else is haram. All right, so this is, uh, he mentioned this uh, quote here of uh, Sufyan uh, al thawri uh, talking about it's better for a person to take your time, so it might take longer, that's why we're talking about the last row, because you might need to do more effort, more in investigation, and this might delay you in coming to the salah, so you end up standing in the last row. So he says this is better that you stand in the last row rather than you come in the first row but then you, you, know, you didn't take the time to investigate and you end up consuming uh, haram. All right, and a few other quotes. We'll skip over those. Move, move on, inshallah, to the next uh, branch of Iman. The next branch of Iman. تحريم الملابس والزيء والأواني وما يكره منها Prohibition of and dislike of certain clothes and eating utensils. Uh, we know that silk is prohibited for who, specifically? Men, men only. Uh, hadith of Anas, whoever will wear silk in this world will not wear it in the next. Very similar to the hadith on the alcohol. If you drink alcohol in this life, and you don't repent, then you'll be prohibited from it in the next life. Same thing for silk. 
If a person wears silk in this world, now there's a fiqh of the silk, we're not going to get into that. All right? I know these, these questions, there's a lot of fiqh involved, we're not going to get into the fiqh of it. Um, but there are, it's not, uh, uh, there is uh, details with it. Right? Uh, just talking about pure silk, but there are details in terms of how much silk is allowed. How much silk is allowed, we're not going to get into the fiqh of that. But just talking about a person wearing pure silk without any reason, without any reason or excuse. Uh, if they wear it in this life, then they will not wear it in the next. Uh, and the hadith of Hudayfa, do not wear silk or brocade and do not eat or drink from vessels of gold or silver. For they are for them in this world, meaning the disbelievers, and they are for you in the next. So we are deprived of it in this life, but we will get it inshallah in the next life. So this is silk, uh, and also including eating and drinking from gold vessels. Right? There are, this is something that uh, in back in the days, the kings and, uh, and, and, the, and the leaders, they would drink in these vessels, right? Gold and, and silver. And this is prohibited. This is prohibited. Right, so uh, the question is, can the, the hadith mentions gold or silver. Do not drink or eat from vessels of gold and silver. Does this apply to other types of precious metals? All right, uh, does this apply to other types of precious metals and stones and these kind of things? The scholars differed over that. Um, some of them said that it applies to anything uh, of that nature. Another said that no, it's actually gold and silver specifically, and you can drink or eat from any other, even if it's even more expensive than gold, you can eat or drink from it, as long as it's not gold or silver. All right, so the, the, the scholars have differed over that, uh, but they, they say that definitely the gold and silver is prohibited, and then they differed whether any other material, even if it's expensive, uh, some of the scholars mentioned that even, even if it's more expensive than the gold and silver, as long as it's not gold and silver, then that, that is what has been prohibited. Allahu alam, even, even if we say that, um, these other materials are allowed. So you can drink and, and, and eat in other uh, types of vessels that are not gold and silver. Even if we say this allowed, it should be avoided because of the meaning of the hadith, which is avoiding these things of uh, extravagance, right? Being extravagant in living. Wallahu alam. And then he brings the hadith uh, that Allah is beautiful, in Allah jamilun yuhibul jamal. So some people might think that because we are not allowed to wear certain types of uh, clothes, the silk, and you cannot drink in gold and silver vessels, that means that we have to avoid looking nice, right? Looking nice or any type of beautification. And that's not the case. So this hadith, a person came to Rasulullah and he says that I like my clothes and I like my shoes to be good looking. And Rasulullah said to him, in Allah jamilun yuhibbul jamal, that Allah is beautiful and he loves beauty. So this does not mean that you have to look raggedy and dressed, um, you know, dressed like you're looking, you, you live on the streets. No, you, you, you can make yourself look good, but without extravagance, without extravagance. Uh, and this is how Rasulullah Sallallahu used to live, as we see in the next hadith, Aisha radiallahu anha once showed us a woolen cloth and a, and a rough lace wrapper. And she said Rasulullah Sallallahu passed away wearing these. So this was something that was far away from extravagance. This is what he used to wear, even though he had the opportunity to get better than that, but this is what he preferred, and this is what he passed away in. A rough waist wrapper and woolen cloth. This is what he was wearing when he passed away. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then the hadith, uh, also, once again, dealing with extravagance. On the day of resurrection, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not look at a man who lets his garment drag on the ground out of pride. Right, this is called isbal, isbal, which is letting your garment drag on the floor out of pride. And there are several hadiths on this, right? Several hadiths on the isbal and dragging your garment out of pride. Some hadiths mention pride. Whoever does this out of pride, uh, then Allah will not look at this person. Other hadiths mention without pride. Whoever does this uh, will have certain such, such and such punishment. And the scholars differ in terms of how do we interpret these hadiths. Uh, one interpretation is that uh, there's something in the Sul of Fiqh called Hamlul Mutlaq. Mutlaq al muqayyid when something is unrestricted in certain texts and is restricted in other texts then we interpret those texts that are unrestricted in light of what is restricted for example 
Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes mentions in the Quran regarding certain um, certain atonements that if you commit a certain sin you have to com you have to free a slave and it will mention in the one verse mentions uh, mu'mina, mu'mina, a believing slave and then some other verses talking about freeing slaves it does not mention believing slave it just says slave so the scholars have mentioned that we interpret the verses that are general meaning slave any slave in light of the verses that mean, mention believing slave meaning that those verses that talk about any slave we're actually what's actually meant is a believing slave all right and this is this is a, a, a topic in usul fiqh which is uh, similar to what is uh, what scholars have mentioned here which is those hadith i mentioned uh, generally you're not allowed to drag the garment out uh, uh, without even mentioning pride we interpret those in light of those other hadith i mentioned that it has to be done out of pride i know the scholars mentioned that regardless pride or not it should be avoided and this is of course uh, the safest thing to do Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually defined in that previous hadith. We didn't mention the rest of the hadith. But the same hadith. Inna Allah jamilun yuhibbul jamal. I forgot to read that last part. Arrogance is to be ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to belittle people. This is what arrogance. So Rasulullah defines arrogance as uh, being ungrateful and belittling, belittling on people, looking down on people. This is what pride is. I already mentioned in that, in that hadith. Yeah, interchangeable. Yeah, al kibr, takabur. Right, the same word is used interchangeably. Yeah, similar meaning. There might be some slight differences, Allah Akbar, but they are used uh, interchangeably. All right, moving on. Al hadi wal arba'un min shu'ab al iman tahim al malaib wal malahi al mukhalifa li sharia. The Quran Taala, "Qul ma 'inda Allahi khairu min al lahwi wa min al tijara." And uh, the hadith, uh, which we'll mention shortly. So the, the verse uh, Allah says, Say what is with Allah is better than playing and trading. Now is trading and playing prohibited? No, it's not. Uh, this is talking about those who allow trade or allow play to distract them from their obligations. And for these people, Allah says that what is with, what is with Allah is better. And there's a, this, this, is, this verse is in Surah al Jum'ah. And there's a context when uh, Rasulullah was delivering the khutbah and a caravan came. Right? A caravan came and a number of sahaba stood up and they went to look at the caravan and to greet the caravan. And they left Rasulullah standing. Tarakuka qa'iman. Right? Allah says that they left you standing while you were giving the khutbah. And so Allah, uh, he criticizes those believers who did that, the sahaba who did that. And the scholars have mentioned, by the way, that this was before uh, the obligation of Jum'ah and this is before they had to remain there. This was an option at this point, so that we don't say that the Sahaba willfully disobeyed Rasulullah This was, uh, this was optional at this point to, to remain in the khutbah, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nonetheless, he criticized them and said that uh, you should have remained with Rasulullah ma Allah khayru min al wa min al tijara. That is, what is with Allah is better than playing and trade. Uh, and then we have the hadith in Sahih Muslim, whoever plays backgammon, man la'iba bid, bid nar, Nardashir. This is a Persian word. It's a Persian word that has been Arabized. Nardashir fakannama sabagha yadahu fi lahmi khinzirin wa damihi. Whoever plays backgammon. This is, they translate it as backgammon. Uh, it's not necessarily the same backgammon that we have today. But this is a game that used, they used to play. This is a game that they used to play. Uh, they translate it as backgammon. It's maybe something similar. Not exactly the same backgammon. Um, whoever, done, whoever plays backgammon has done something akin to, to dipping his finger into the meat and blood of swine. Uh, uh, other uh, hadith mention dice. So this hadith mentions backgammon or a, a game that you should play called nardashir. Other hadith mentions nard, which is the word for dice. And, 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 and uh, different narrations, and it mentions the same thing. That uh, whoever does this plays with backgammon or plays with dice. Uh, then this is similar to a person dipping his finger into the meat and blood of swine. So we have these hadith talking about dice, right? And uh, hadith is authentic about whoever plays with dice, and then this narration whoever plays with uh, backgammon. So what is the ruling on these type of games? 
the scholars have, once again, uh, differed in terms of how do we interpret these ah hadith. And with agreement upon two things. Number one, any of these games that involve gambling, prohibited by consensus, no, no dispute. Any of these games that have gambling, then these, this, these are distributed, uh, th this is uh, agreement that these are, these are prohibited. And any of these games that distracts you from your obligations, your religious obligations, or any other types of obligations regarding to your, your family and so on, or your uh, obligation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then these are also prohibited. Right? So these games cause you to miss your salah, or cause you to miss providing for your family or anything else, then agreement that this, these things are prohibited. Assuming that there's no gambling involved, and there is no distracting from your obligations. What is the ruling on these games that have dice? All right, um, the scholars, once again, they, they differed. So uh, some of the scholars, they said that uh, this, these hadith were mentioned because these games were always played with gambling. Right? These games were always played with gambling. And so when Rasulullah prohibited these things, he prohibited them because they were dealing with gambling. That people used to play these games and they gamble with these games. And uh, they say, these scholars also say that if there is no gambling involved, then it is permissible. If there's no gambling involved and it does not distract a person from their obligations, then uh, they, this, a group of scholars say that th this is permissible. Another group of scholars say that whether it has gam gambling or no gambling, the hadith mentions dice. Not this narration, but the other narration mentioned. It mentions dice, and anything with dice is prohibited. Anything with dice is prohibited. And then they discussed why is it prohibited. And they said that any game that has chance, involves chance, then these are games that are prohibited because these things have no benefit in the dunya or the akhir. Right? Uh, there's no skill involved. There is no working of the mind. It's a game pure of chance. So they said that the reason why a game like this and anything else that involves purely chance, then these should be avoided because there's no benefit in them. Right? So this is another view of the scholars to say that, and then they would extend this as well to not just any game, games with dice, but anything that involves chance, which include certain card games. Right? Um, you know, there are certain card games. You win based on the hand you're dealt. Pure, pure, purely chance, right? And there's no skill involved. So according to this group of scholars, this would, this would apply to these kind of things. And as we mentioned, the other group, which is that uh, as long as they don't involve gambling, then uh, they would be permissible. As long as they don't involve gambling or distracting a person from their obligations. Mm. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Oh yeah, so those scholars will mention that this applies to anything that involves games of chance. Uh, as opposed to games of skill. Games where you're using your mind or you're uh, involved some kind of skill. These are allowed because this is benefiting you in this life. And maybe in the next life as well. But games of chance has no benefit. You're not gaining anything from it. So according to those scholars, this would uh, be prohibited based on this hadith. And the other hadith I mentioned, dice. And as you mentioned, the other view is that as long as they don't involve gambling and distracting a person from their obligations, then this will be permissible. Allahu I'm not going to give a ruling, but this is what the, the scholars have uh, mentioned regarding uh, these types of games. Um, obviously, because the hadith mentions dice specifically, it is very much safe to stay away from uh, a word that the Rasulullah has used. Right? He used this word dice, it comes in the hadith. So it would be better to refrain from this because this has been specific, specifically mentioned in the hadith. So it would be better to stay away from games that have uh, something where Rasulullah specifically mentioned uh, to avoid. Wallahu a'lam. Athani wal arba'oon min shu'ab al-iman al-iqtisad fi al-nafqa wa tahrimi akl al-mal bil-qawlihi ta'ala wa la taj'al yadaka maghlulatan ila unqika wa la tabasutha kulla al-basli fa taq'uda maluman mahsura. Moderation in spending expenditure and prohibition of consuming wealth unlawfully. Uh, uh, he mentioned the verse, and do not make your hand chained to your neck or extend it completely, becoming blame and insolvent. This verse is talking about not being stingy, all right, not being stingy and not spending at all, and also avoiding the other extreme, which is being very loose and just wasting, right, wasting. So do not make your hand chained, 
the right meaning, don't be stingy, so stingy with your wealth, nor extend it completely where you are just dishing out money left and right. right? Both of these are extremes that should, that should be avoided according to the verse. And the other verse, and they are those who, when they spend, do so not excessively or sparingly. Once again, mentioning, avoiding these two extremes. Don't be stingy, but also don't be excessive in the spending. And they are between that, justly between that. They are between the, the two extremes of being extravagant in spending and also being stingy in not spending. And the hadith in Sahih Muslim, Mughir ibn Shu'bah narrates that Rasulullah forbade uh, three things, excessive chit-chat, and the wasting of money, and excessing, excessive axing, begging, basically, right? Begging, begging for, for things. الثالث والأربعون شعب الإيمان ترك الغل والحسد ونحوهما ونحوهما لقوله تعالى من شر حاسد ومن شر حاسد إذا حسد ولقوله تعالى أم يحسدون الناس على ما أتاهم الله من فضله and other verses mentioned here uh, the, the abandoning of rancor, envy and similar feelings we talked about envy before anybody remember what was the definition of envy that we mentioned either last class or two classes before the definition of envy Right. right. To wish that a ni'ma, a blessing, is taken away from somebody. All right. So not only do you want that thing that somebody else has, but you want it to be taken away from them. This is envy. And this is prohibited, and this is a major sin, and one of the diseases of the heart. And we are commanded uh, in the Quran to seek Allah's refuge from the envier. Uh, and a number of hadiths also warn against envy and hatred and any other type of behavior that does not befit believers. Do not hate one another or envy one another or turn your backs on one another. Rather be Allah's slaves while being each other's brothers. It is not halal for a Muslim to break off relations with his brother for more than three consecutive nights so that they both turn away from each other. The better of them is the one who gives the first greeting. All right, so... Um, do not hate each other, do not envy each other, do not turn your backs on each other. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows though that human beings sometimes have issues and disputes and inevitably you might get into an argument with somebody, another believer. And so the sharia has allowed a cooling off period, three nights. All right? And this is from the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he allows this cooling off period because people are arguing with each other and voices are raised and uh, a person can say things that they will regret so this is why this three nights is allowed you're allowed three nights don't talk to that person cool off all right uh, let the anger go down a bit after these three nights have passed now it's it's, it's prohibited now to continue to ignore each other and uh, uh, at this point they, they must uh, come back and speak to each other even if it's just salam Right, the, the hadith mentions the one who gives the salam first is the best of the two. So even if they just give the salam, it doesn't mean that they have to become best friends again, but they cannot cut each other off. So after three nights have passed, then they, uh, they must interact back with each other. They don't have to speak, you know, become best friends again, but they have to maintain that uh, relationship again uh, and mend that relationship. So it is not permissible for three consecutive nights to pass by when they are turning away from each other and boycotting each other. Uh, Al Hassan al Basri says that this was the very first sin committed in heaven. What was that? Envy. With who? Iblis, right? Iblis. He was the, Iblis, the, fir the first person who came up with this whole concept of en being envious. He said, Ana khayru minhu. He said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I'm better than Adam. Min nar wa min tain. That you created me from the fire, and you created him from uh, clay and dirt, and, and I'm better than him. So this was the first sin to be committed in the heaven. And the scholars have also mentioned that this is possibly also the first sin committed on earth. All right? Because when the two sons of uh, Adam, alayhi salam, one of them killed the, the other. All right? One of them killed the other. What was the reason why he killed his brother? Envy. All right? One of them sacrificed, uh, and it was accepted from one. It was not accepted from the other. And so one of the sons, he said to the other, I'm going to kill you. And the other, he said that if you extend your hand to kill me, I'm not going to extend my hand to kill you. 
and he allowed himself to be killed by his brother and this was the first murder that was committed and the, 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 the root of this murder was envy and uh, envy as some of the quotes mentioned here a person who is envious they never find any peace never find any peace mark these five truths an envious man finds no peace an envious man finds no peace because when you're always looking at what other, somebody else has then you're not going to be able to focus on yourself right if you're always looking at what's on the other person's plate you're not going to be in, in, enjoy your own your own meal right you're always looking at what did this person's plate what did this person get this person got more than me this person got less than me they got this i didn't get this then you're not going to be able to enjoy what you have so the envious person never finds any peace and another quote a man who does wrong through envy is like a very similar to a person who is wronged has he has no peace of mind it's always grieved always concerned about other people and so you're always going to be in a state of constant uh, grief and no peace of mind. All right, moving on. I think maybe we will uh, end with this one, inshallah. The fourth point and other verses that are mentioned. Allah says, indeed, those who like so the, the, the 44th branch of Iman, the sanctity of people's reputations and the obligation not to cast aspersions on them. All right, so uh, not accusing people. Uh, of what they don't have, especially, and the most serious of that being accusing somebody of uh, adultery, accusing somebody of adultery and committing, uh, committing these types of sins. Indeed, those who like that immorality should be spread or publicized amongst those who have believed will have a very painful punishment in this world and the hereafter. Those who spread gossip that this person did this and this person did that, then this is a, a major sin which incurs punishment, painful punishment in this life and in the next life. Uh, this verse was re re revealed regarding uh, the Prophet's wife, Aisha radiallahu anha, as we know, uh, or we might, some of you might not know, that she was accused of adultery. She was accused of adultery. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala re revealed verses in Surah Nur, clearing her of this charge and declaring that she was innocent and warning those who took part. So she was accused of uh, adultery and there, there were Sahaba believers who spread this and they made it worse. They made the situation much worse. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala criticizes them and says that those who spread these types of uh, rumors, then they will have a very painful punishment in this life and the next life. And in the verse, the verse uh, another verse mentions, those who accuse chaste women will never even think of touching uh, anything touching their chastity and are good believers are cursed in this life and in the hereafter. So accusing people of adultery, innocent people, women, or even this also includes men as well. All right, the verse mentions women, but this also includes men. But women, it's even more serious because uh, this is a, a, a bigger uh, disgrace to accuse a woman, a ch chaste woman of adultery. This is a bigger disgrace. But it also ap applies to men as well. And this is one of the seven major sins. Seven major sins. Rasulullah says, uh, he says, avoid seven major sins. And he mentions amongst them, slandering chaste uh, women, chaste believing women who are uh, unaware of these types of accusations. Uh, and then the hadith of Sahih Muslim, Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu narrates, every Muslim is a brother to every other Muslim. He ne neither disparages him, humiliates, or despises him. And the fear of Allah lies here. He pointed to his heart three times. And it is sufficient evil for a man that he despises his fellow Muslim brother. And every Muslim to another Muslim, these things are protected and sacred. His blood, his possessions, and his honor. His blood, his possessions, and his honor. And uh, lastly, concluded the hadith of Abu Dhar in Sahih Bukhari that the Prophet said, Let no man accuse another of unrighteousness or kufr, lest he should be mistaken and he himself be as he says. This is a very uh, stern warning to people who accuse others of being uh, unrighteous, fasik, or accusing another person of being kafir. You know, avoid those two things unless you have uh, solid proof or evidence. Accusing somebody of being a fasik. Of being unrighteous or accusing somebody of being kafir then these are very serious things and if the person is mistaken then the hadith mentioned that the person who made these claims it will return back on them you accuse somebody of being uh, a, a fasid a, a disobedient person and they are not that way then this will return back to you 
or you, per you accuse a person of being a disbeliever and they're not a disbeliever, then this returns uh, back to you. So these are very serious things to avoid. And only if you have uh, concrete proof and evidence, then you make these accusations. Other than that, stay away from accusing people of these things. These are very serious things. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. We end here on the 44th branch of Iman next week, inshallah, uh, starting from number 45. All right, any questions? Any questions? We will take those now, inshallah. Any questions? If the uh, sisters have any questions, you can also. Um, is, it, is the, the numbers there? Okay. Okay. Yeah, the chest in, in particular that's also been spoken about. Um, that's also disputed, but many scholars allow it because there's not much, it's a, most of it is based on skill. Most of it is based on skill. So many scholars allow chess. It's based on that. And it's not really due to chance. Um, would that be considered gambling? Allah Alam. We have to look into that. So this specific scenario the scholars have mentioned, um, to avoid gambling in situations like that is for one person not to pay. For the, the, the fee to be waived for at least one person. And once, that, what, once the fee is waived, then it's, it won't be considered gambling. Well, uh, wallahu alam, we can look into that further, inshallah. Any other questions? So the question is about extravagance. Should he get a Honda Civic or a Lamborghini? So this this has has to do with the concept called zuhud, which is um, how we translate zuhud like asceticism, all right? Which is it's not prohibited, all right? It's not prohibited unless you know you have to like steal your way to get it and cheat your way to get it. Then obviously it becomes prohibited. So, but if it's within your means, you can afford a Lamborghini, then it is permissible to buy it, but zuhd would be to uh, refrain from these kind of, kind of things. So it's, it's not a matter of halal and haram, it's a matter of uh, being attached to these things and not attached to these things. So Rasulullah chose to not be attached to these things. Not that because it's, uh, it's uh, prohibited, but because he, his, his, his heart and mind was somewhere else. All right, but it doesn't mean that it's uh, prohibited. It doesn't mean it's prohibited. Uh, and it's possible that a person can, uh, they can own like a, 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 a supercar, but they are, their heart is not attached to it. Meaning, if it's taken away from them, they're fine. Right? So if a person like that, then Allahu Alam, this is permissible. But what's per, what is looked down upon is when you are attached to these things. That in the, in, the, in the way that you have this car, and if it's taken away from you, then you, your whole life comes apart. Then that shows that you, you, know, you are attached to it. This is what is looked down upon. But just merely having these things, these are, and it's within your means, then these are permissible. These are permissible. Whether it's the best thing to do or not, that's, you know, it depends on the person. It depends on the person. Allah. Okay. Any other questions? All right. So, inshallah, we will uh, conclude that. Subhanallah wa bihamdik. Nashallah ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruhu wa natubu ilayh. Um, there are snacks in the back, I believe, right? Snacks provided in the back. Inshallah.